In this video, we're gonna talk about keys to high performance in sales. So really the high performance sales habits that really took me from an average-ish salesperson to one of the best people in the industry. And I will tell you like, watch this video to the end because even if you don't know the words to say or you're not a master at the words to say, and the words to say are important, but even if you're mediocre at those, if you nail this stuff, most likely you're still gonna beat people who maybe are really good at the scripts or are really good at the language, but don't have this. Okay, it's really the difference a lot of times between average salespeople and just truly exceptional people. And also, if you master what's in this training, um, it sets you up for success in anything else you're going to do in life. Like part of the reason I have had tremendous business success is because I've mastered this stuff early on, right? That a lot of this is not just the mindset, but it's also more of the habits, the rituals, the daily standards of how to become great at anything. Okay, so um, this is video number six. And the advanced selling techniques series. Um, what we're going to cover in this is a review of what we covered so far in the series. Setting and hitting your sales targets and projections. Two reasons you miss your projections. How to avoid sales ruts and sustain high performance. Energy management. Rituals for sales success and how to break sales ruts. So we're going to talk about sales slumps, why you get in them, how to break them, all of that stuff. So before we get started, quick little shout out my old sales manager and mentor, Taylor Welch. A lot of these frameworks I learned from him. And this is a big part of uh, why I grew when I was selling under him on his sales team is because um, a lot of these frameworks I'm about to share with you that had a huge impact on me. A lot of that was inspired by him. So I just want to give him a quick shout out. And he has a few books, including one coming out on sales on Amazon. So you can go check those out. They're really good. And I uh, just want to give credit where credit is due. So review what we covered so far. So I just want to make sure you know kind of where to mentally put this training and the series of what we covered so far. Because again, this is the, the sixth video. So the first video we covered was sales first principles and philosophy. So this is just how to think about sales. The next one's the belief ladder, okay? Which really talks about our under method, underlying methodology of sales, our kind of thesis around sales, okay? And that's gonna be really how we approach the sales process later, all right? Then we talked about the inner game of sales. That's exactly what it sounds like. That's like the mindset, beliefs, et cetera, around sales. Then there's subcommunication and tonality, which is basically everything that it sounds like, right? That's like what's going on behind the words. And then there's keys to high performance. This is actually what to do to carry yourself as a high performer in sales or really anything that you do, okay? So uh, after this, I promise, we'll get into like what to say and the scripting and how to pitch and like these different things, which is also very, very important. But this is the foundational stuff we're gonna do first. So let's talk about setting and hitting projections. So to do that, I need to talk about the difference between goals and projections. So my company doesn't set goals as a salesperson. You set projections. So think of goals as like your highest aspirations projections are your bare minimum standards. That's the numbers you're going to hit even if shit hits the fan, okay? So what's really the difference and why do we set projections? Goals, like, you know, 10x this, right? That's fine, but in sales, they usually get us excited and then let us down, okay? And then we're not able to diagnose why. Projections allow us to reverse engineer the path through our goals and then hedge, and then by doing that, reverse engineering, understand the input output equation and then hedge the inputs all right projections also give us accuracy right so again they help you understand what inputs go into what outputs right once you understand what inputs go to what outputs it allows you to adjust behavior accordingly to be able to manufacture the results that you want okay it also keeps everybody accountable when mastered this will give you and your salespeople, or if you're a salesperson you control okay a very high safety ratio to where when you say you're gonna do something, you do it. You say you're gonna do something, you do it. You say you're gonna do something, you do it. And it fosters this feeling of control. Control lends a certainty, certainty sells, right? So again, when you have a team of salespeople that all across the board, let's say you got six guys, six girls, whatever, uh, all across the board, they say they're gonna hit a number, they hit it. They say they're gonna hit a number, they hit it. I'm telling you that is a high performing sales team and the certainty and the level in which that sales team carries themselves and the awareness they have is just gonna be unmatched, okay? And this is one of the keys of why our sales teams have just performed tremendously better than really um, almost any other sales team in our industry, at least, which is like the direct response, coaching industry, et cetera. So how do you actually set projections? So at the end of every week, you're gonna set projections for the following week, okay? This is gonna include your inputs, so that could be anything from your lead gen activities, your outbound, your follow-up, how many calls you're gonna take, et cetera, and then your outputs, which is really the amount of closes you're gonna get and the amount of cash. Okay, so we really want to get an idea of our leading and lagging indicators here. Now, I made this spreadsheet a long time ago. This is years and years ago. 
to just kind of demonstrate this, but I just want you to look over here where my screen is highlighted. And um, essentially, you can see what I want to do is every month and every week, you can see I have the weeks mapped out here as well. And this is what I used to do when I was in sales. Like that's where I got that sheet from. Is what I want to do is I want to map out like, okay, let's say I want to hit 10 units, okay? So if I want to hit 10 units, well, what I should do is I should hedge, all right? So if I want to hit 10 units, I want to base my behaviors off trying to hit 13 units. Does that make sense? And so 13 is kind of my goal. 10 is my projection, all right? Now the difference is, again, the projection is hedged. The goal is not, not necessarily hedged, but both are reverse engineered. So what I do is I take 13, and I just figure out based on what my metrics are that I should be tracking, what I need to do to hit 13, okay? So let's say in this example, I have to get 77 scheduled live consults, 59, um, or sorry, 77 scheduled consults, 59 because the show rate's 76% or whatever. Um, I know my offer rate's 67%, so that's gonna get 40 offers. And then I know out of 40 offers, I'm gonna close 13, which by the way, wouldn't be very good. But I'm just giving a random example here. So maybe my offer to close rate's about 13. So I can kind of, you see, I can kind of reverse engineer what's going on here. Now, over time, when you do this, what really happens is you can start to see if you're not hitting your projections, are you not being accurate or realistic based on your show up rate percentages, your offer to close percentages, et cetera? Are you, uh, is there a deficiency in skill set? Like does your, like in this example, your close percentage sucks. Like you should probably be doing 20 units, maybe 25 units potentially. So uh, is it that? Um, is it a lack of volume? It's like, no, all my efficiency metrics were really, really, really good. I just didn't have enough live consults. Now, was that because I just was unrealistic with what I was projecting? Or did I have not, not have enough live consults because I, as the closer, didn't do enough outbound, outbound activity, right? Which, you know, as a closer, you got to do outbound. I mean, it, it, believe me, any, any great closer... If you're not on a call, the only thing you're trying to do is get on a call. And the only two things you can do to try to get on a call is reach out to people you haven't talked to yet and reach out to people you have talked to yet, aka follow up, right? So if you're not on a call during the sales day, nine to five, eight to five, however much you're working, you need to be doing things that are gonna get you on a call or set you up for success on a call later, right? So again, that's a, another big difference, you know, neither here nor there about great salespeople is what do you do when you have a no-show? How do you spend that extra hour, right? Well, a great salesperson, they do it either with follow-up or outbound, right? They still commit time to that activity, okay? I'm not saying you might wanna take a, you know, you can take a 20 minute break during the day and take a walk or whatever to like refresh. I mean, that's fine. But most mediocre salespeople, especially in our industry, what they do is if they have five live calls, but two don't show up, that two hours in which they have free, you know, they're going to lunch, they're taking a walk, they're listening to a podcast. So it's like, no, you need to be working. Right. And if you do really commit to that time, you're going to get way better results. So, anyways, that's a little bit of a rant, neither here nor there. Another key thing about projections, and this is almost like the easiest way to think about it, is you want it to be high enough to where you hit it about 75 to 80% of the time. So, that means 20 to 25% of the time you're going to miss because you, you, you're, you're right on a little above the edge of um, what you could do 100% of the time. Right. You're just a little bit above the edge. Like you're always just pushing that boundary. So if you're not missing from time to time, you're not pushing yourself enough. Now, if you're missing all of the time, there's an issue, which we're going to cover one of the couple issues in a second. If you're hitting all of the time, you're not pushing yourself far enough. So I got this from Andy S. Grove from High Output Management. He was uh, one of the main guys in Intel. And he talks about the KPIs used to set for people. They're not high enough unless they miss them 20 to 25% of the time, right? Because when there's that accountability... Because in, in our culture, we have a culture where missing projections is unacceptable, right? So if you have a culture where missing projections is unacceptable and there's a high safety ratio when we say we're going to do something that we actually do it and you can get people to set projections to a level to where, man, it's right on that border of being able to do it every time. Like they're going to miss sometimes. That's where you really get the best out of people. You get innovation. You get... um. You just get, and people will actually surprise their own selves of how much they can actually do. And in fact, like part of the reason I got so good at sales, and particularly, I was a very, very good closer who was also very, very, very good at outbound and follow-up. That was kind of like my claim to fame. And the reason I got good at all that stuff is because our projections were so high. 
that if I didn't do that, there was no way I was going to hit projections if I didn't do a ton of outbound, ton of follow-up. And the culture was of, of that, that if you miss projections, it was unacceptable. So it forced me to really just prove to myself different ways I could still produce revenue and still produce deals, even if let's say the inbound leads weren't there. Okay. So again, a little bit of a rant, but important here. So again, projections, that's a good benchmark. You should, if you're a sales manager, you want to do this with your sales team and adjust them. If you're a sales rep, you want to be able to hit a 75, 80% of the time. If you're miss, hitting it every time, not good. If you're hitting it, if you're missing it, you know, more than that, also not good. Now, there's only three reasons you can miss projections, okay? Number one is a lack of accuracy. So you just simply weren't accurate, right? So for example, you expect to get 10 closes this week, but you only had 14 live calls. You made 11 offers, right? Um, so you hit six, all right? So like, again, if you have 11 offers on the board, getting 10 is like pretty tough, you know, in, unless you're like extremely cherry picking your offers. Generally getting 10 out of 11 is like pretty tough, okay? I mean, 10 closes even out of 14 live calls usually pretty tough. A lot of it can depend on lead quality, right? But generally with cold traffic, that would be pretty tough, right? So that would be a lack of accuracy as long as this last statement that you spend all your downtime maximally doing outbound and follow-up and et cetera, right? Because if well, we'll talk about the next one, the next reason is ins insufficient volume of behavior. So let's take the same example, but you did no outbound and follow-up, right? So you can't sit back there and say, oh, I've done everything I could do to hit projections. All you really did is you did really well in the closing call. Like your closing percentage was very, very high, but you didn't have very many calls and you did nothing to create opportunity when you weren't on the calls. Okay. So again, like you see the issue with that. So that's a volume. All right. So the difference between accuracy and volume is really, are they doing everything off the calls as they can? Now, accuracy is very important and still the sales rep's responsibility, right? Like you need to be accurate, okay? Like if you're, uh, if you forecast the weather, you know, look, you can miss sometimes, but generally if you're not accurate, you're going to lose a job. Insufficient efficiency of behavior is the third one. So this means your inputs were good, right? You were doing outbound, you were doing follow-up, but you didn't get the leverage from them that you were looking for. So this shows up in two forms. Either number one, your closing ratio is low, or number two, your set ratio is low. That's it, right? So either out of the reach outs or outbound dials or texts or follow-ups that you're doing, you're not getting a sufficient response. That would be the set ratio. Or closing ratio is out of the live consults you're having. You're just not closing enough, right? So that could either be, now, why would you have an inefficiency in behavior? Could either be skill set gaps, where you need to get better, or it could mean you're in a rut, which we're going to talk about, okay? So hopefully this makes sense. Now, if you're a um, sales manager, again, just some key things. You want to really gauge your team or a business owner is running a sales team. You really want to gauge your team so that they're at that 75, 80% mark. All right. And the other thing is too, is I'm talking a lot about if you're a closer, if you're not on the calls, like to do outbound and the importance of that and follow up. Now, if you're a business owner though, if you have a really great closer, it's actually in your best own best interest to just pack their calendars full to where they really have no time to do anything but their follow-up, essentially. Because if you have a closer closing like at this rate, right, 14 live calls and they're hitting six, I mean, that's 40%, that's pretty good. Um, and then let's say that's cold traffic. It's, a, you know, you don't want the not give this guy calls to make him do outbound. It's more profitable just to pack his calendar as full as possible, right? It's more profitable for him and for you. So just keep that in mind. Some people get with their closers, get just this ego of like, I need to make my sales team do outbound, uh, this and that. You, you should just really set them up to succeed as much as possible. The, the key thing is, is if you're a closer and you don't have enough calls for whatever reason, maybe there's a dip in marketing, whatever happens, there's no shows. You need to utilize that time efficiently. You can only do that through outbound and follow-up. So with that being said, how to avoid ruts and to sustain high performance. So what's a rut? So a rut, look, like the way I define it is a 5% swing in close rate sustained over 30 days. So uh, they're closing 30%, they go to 25%, okay? And you could even potentially, based on some of this qualitative data, I'm just going to say down here, is chunk that down to 14 days, okay? But the reason why we can't do that is because of what's called regression to the mean. So regression to the mean is the natural variance that happens in numbers, right? So like, if you look at um, a salesperson's closing ratio, you'll have like a baseline, but then obviously the actual performance os oscillates uh, up and down along that line, right? So what happens is, is we can't look at 
a one day time frame or a three day time frame or a four day time frame from a pure number standpoint, we can't look at those short time frames and diagnose a rut because it could just be a string of bad calls. Okay. Now, if we look at the macro, we definitely can use numbers, right? So this is what I put here. Um, dips in performance are natural in the micro, but in the macro, it's always the salesperson, uh, unless it's like if everybody's going down, like if the entire sales team is going down, then it's either lead quality or it's the leadership. And a lot of times it's actually the leadership, most times. So um, it's, it's usually not lead quality. It can be though. I've seen cases like that. Um, so again, micro versus macro and a big, big thing here. And this is just, it takes an experienced sales rep to know this. You can't let ebbs and flows and the micro throw you into a rut. Case in point, it actually can happen to where you can be a phenomenal salesperson, take 10 live calls in a row, close zero, take the next five calls and close four out of five. And that would put you at what a, you know, um, what would that be? Like 28% closing ratio, something around there. Now that's, it depends on your offer. That could in some situations be considered good. That could be considered bad. Some situations just kind of depends on your company and your offer. But that's definitely not like you're not bombing it, right? But an, ex an experienced sales rep during that string of 10 calls in which they just had just quite frankly, just bad calls or maybe some no-shows or whatever. During that string of calls, sometimes a bad, an experienced sales rep, they can get in their head and start to throw themselves into a rut when it's really just a natural variance in the micro, okay? So just keep in mind, like sometimes you have to be patient and just control what you can control, all right? Now, again, a big issue with this is we can't look at quantitative data in the micro because of regression to the mean. So what we also wanna do to catch ruts sooner than 14 to 30 days, like I said, because we don't wanna wait 14 to 30 days to see if you're in a rut. So what we do to catch it sooner is we qualitative measure it, okay? And we do that across three key areas, not four. So we do that across three key areas, physical, emotional, and mental. So this is also when we have one-on-ones with our sales reps, we always are checking in on these areas to number one, diagnose any ruts, or number two, keep ruts from happening before they happen, okay? So um, not only should your leadership and your sales management be looking into these with your sales reps on their one-on-one specifically, but at the same time, you as a sales rep, you want to be mentally checking these on a daily basis with your end of day journal or something like along those lines to just kind of like be self-aware about anything in your life that's going on externally that could impact what's happening on the calls. Okay. So three key areas, physical, emotional, mental. So physical is pretty straightforward, but it's usually the issue most of the times. So this is exercise, diet, sleep, water, meditation, your routines. Um, I will tell you with sales, it works really, really well to have a morning routine and a nighttime routine um, and any type of high performance going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time every day is a game changer. Now, exercise, diet to really get your energy up and your mental clarity and your focus, eliminate brain fog. Like that's common sense. You should know that, but that's very important. Drinking enough water, also meditation. Um, these things are very, very important. So I'll give you an example. When I was very inexperienced, I, I had this issue where I would be really good for like a day, two days. Then I'd have a, I'd have a horrible day. Then I'd be good for two or three days. Then I have a horrible day. I could just never show up consistently. And it just, it just drove me nuts. Um, I just, man, I just could not sustain consistent high performance. And the problem with that is oftentimes like the difference between an okay sales rep versus an excellent sales rep is just pushing across a handful of deals that like, look, they were, it's like, they're not lay downs. They're actually the hard ones to close. And if you're not in peak state, you don't get those, right? And so like, you know, you, you miss a deal here, you miss a deal here just because your energy is not there. And, and over the month, it starts to add up. And instead of doing 20 units of the month and making 20,000, you only did 10, right? And it's because of that lack of consistency and just missing these deals here and there that start to add up, right? Well, a lot of that happens because of your energy. And when I was inexperienced, the only thing I changed that quite literally probably increased my closing ratio by like 50%. So like it probably took me from 20% to, you know, 35%. I don't know if that's 50%, but it was a huge jump. One of the biggest things I changed, and it sounds so basic, but it's what I changed. is I just standardized when I went to bed, went to bed at 8.30 p.m. every single night, woke up at 5 a.m. every single day. 
And I just continue to do that. And there's so much research that shows like even doing that uh, helps all, almost um, alleviate tons of different mental illnesses. Um, obviously, if you've ever done it yourself, your, your, your uh, circadian rhythm and your hormones, all of these things optimize so much better when you standardize when you go to bed and when you wake up and you make sure you get enough sleep every single night. And then your sleep's also quality, right? So get an aura ring or something like that. Man, when I started doing that, I just started showing up in peak state every single day with great energy. And uh, it stabilized my performance. And my per I went really from a mediocre person on that sales team to being the best person on that sales team from that time on to the time I left. And then the other things that I did on top of that is, you know, when I got up at 5 a.m. every single day, I did a morning routine. That morning routine included exercise, included drinking water, and it included um, a meditation and breath work, which I will say, I don't do as much now, but in sales, when you're really trying to actively listen to somebody, doing meditation and breath work, either uh, just at least in the morning, but you can even do like a quick little breath work in the middle of the day just to sort of reset. Doing that just tremendously helps you get out of your head and focus all of your attention on the prospect and just listen and let like the right things to say in the words and all of that stuff come through you. I know that sounds woo woo, but I'm telling you, it makes a tremendous difference. And so that was a really, really big thing with focus. And there's tons of actually peer reviewed research that show that meditation and similar practices increase the amount of mental focus. So like, that's not a woo woo thing that actually is a real thing. So sleep, meditation, routines, very, very important. So again, what you want to look for is, first of all, if you're not doing these things, do those things, okay? We'll talk about my actual routine in just a second. But oftentimes with sales reps, what you'll find is they're doing those things and they're getting great results. Then because they're getting great results, they think they don't need to do those things anymore. So they stop doing those things. They continue to get great, good results for a little bit because of the lead and lag. And then they, the performance starts to drop off. And then they don't diagnose that, oh, I need to go back to doing all the things I said I was going to do and doing all of these things that allowed me to have this peak state. And by the way, when I say peak state, I'm not talking about like jumping up and down Tony Robbins peak state type of bullshit. Um, and I love Tony Robbins, by the way, but that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, just, just having really good, clean energy, uh, sustained energy through the day, no brain fog, et cetera, right? And just, just good mental and emotional well-being, right? Like that's what I mean. And that's what you get from sleep, routines, et cetera. So moving on from that, that's the first area. The second area is emotional. So how is your current emotional state in general? What's happening outside of work emotionally? Uh, is there anything affecting your ability to stay present? Okay, so classic example, maybe somebody in your family died. Maybe you got injured. Maybe your girlfriend cheated on you. I mean, this is one example too is uh, one time I like snapped the rib uh, and I was doing jujitsu. I was super into jujitsu and I was also into working out, um, still am. And I really injured my rib and I couldn't do anything. And so like I lost out on the physical side, not granted, I couldn't do stuff if I tried to, but then also it just, man, it was just in my head and I was just so like down and my energy was just not there. And it did affect my sales performance. It was like my worst sales month at the company I was at the entire year was that month that I hurt my rib. So um, emotional can be something, but a lot of times it's people you either have, you know, a marital issue or something going on with their kids or relationships, uh, parents, you know, a lot of times it comes down to that. And so it's good if you're a manager to be aware of that, or if you're a rep, you need to be self-aware that, okay, you know, I almost need to compartmentalize a little bit and allow these sales calls to be their own universe and suspend sort of what's going on on the outside until the container of this conversation is over. Then we go into mental. Okay. So there's physical, emotional, mental, mental. There's a couple, a couple aspects of this. The number one thing is vision and clarity. So do you have clear goals? Do you have clear, strong reasons? Uh, behind why you want those goals and are you progressing towards those goals or do you feel like you're progressing towards those goals? Okay. So we need to make sure we check the boxes of all of those things. A couple common pitfalls. Sometimes the vision is too big and they don't know how to get there or the vision is too small or the vision is like smaller than their current situation. Okay. So those are two things to watch out for. Oftentimes, like if you find your reps in a rut, it's like usually after they hit their best month, they don't know how to beat that month. They don't know how to think of goals anymore. They're burned out. So it's like a lot of times, like you have to make sure there's a constant gap between where they are now to where they want to be. So that if you're a manager, that's how to think about it. If you're a rep, 
you need to impose that gap on yourself, okay? And constantly figure out where am I going? What do I need to do to get there? And sometimes like you have to change it. Like, you know, if you're a rep and let's say you produced 42 units, you broke the company record and you're like, dude, I have no idea how I could ever do 42 units and sustain that. Maybe the goal and the gap now is just sustaining a nice 35 units a month and starting to put more money away for investing and also working on different specific skills within the call, you know, certain things like that. So you have to be creative with how you manufacture that gap. It's also why having good leadership and management is so important. Another thing, do you have standards and values for how you do things? Or are you holding yourself accountable to those? Um, do you feel like you're growing, getting better? Do you know where your gap is? We just talked about that. How are your inputs? Okay, so our outputs in the world are dictated by our inputs, right? Information in is, is what uh, creates our outputs. So the more information and feedback we take in in regard to our craft, the more we're going to excel at our craft. So classic example, some good wins is like, or some good inputs is like listening to your past wins on sales calls, uh, sales content, personal development content, and um, uh, growing and, and developing your industry acumen. So what that means is if you sell business related stuff, getting more business related knowledge, right? And understanding your industry better. If you sell health related stuff and maybe it's towards stem cells, understanding stem cells better, right? That's also going to help you on the calls. So those are good inputs. Bad inputs are distractions. So for instance, like there was one time I went into a rut uh, when I was selling full time and it was because I was constantly worried and reading about real estate. I was like, oh, I got to get into real estate. Huge distraction, very stupid. And then also another bad input could be uh, upset clients. Um, there's a lot of times where one upset client can message a salesperson, throw the salesperson into an entire rut. They lose all their conviction. Keep in mind, they've enrolled hundreds of people. Maybe 90% of them have great results. One person sends them a message, throws them in a rut. It happens all the time. So these are things to just look out for. Okay, if your sales reps are going to a rut or you're trying to stay self-aware as a sales rep. One other thing I put under the mental thing is maturity. And uh, this is just something to watch out for, but Oftentimes, especially in the online culture that we have right now and social media, how bad comparison is, and I've even sus been suspect of this, is, uh, you know, young people just have no patience nowadays whatsoever. Um, they constantly chase things. They're unhappy when they get it. So they chase something else. They're unhappy when they get that. They chase something else. They're unhappy when they get that repeat, okay? So um, sometimes what maturity can mean is just relaxing and letting go in the season that you're in and trusting what's just going to happen in time. Um, another great example of maturity is like, I find a lot of guys or girls with, you know, they're married, they're with kids. Um, they they don't have this erratic, like, oh my God, I got to, you know, do this, do this, do this, do this. And I got to achieve this to be happy. I'm not happy. It's like, oftentimes they're just way more steady mentally and emotionally. Right. So it doesn't necessarily mean that's who you hire, but it's just something to watch out for and coach people on is just having this maturity and, and, and making sure that people have a healthy mindset and respect to their goals. Because there's very, very, very many people who it's like, I'm not going to be happy until I get this, which is fine until they get that and they hit 40 units in a month or broke, break the company record. And then they're in a massive rut. I mean, it happens so often. So you just want to be aware of this stuff. So two other very, very, very common reasons that reps fall in the ruts. Uh, Neil Rackman, he did a study. He was the author of Spin Selling to where they were noticing among various companies that after nine months, the sales performance of the reps fell off. And what they found from doing this study is that in the beginning, um, the reps weren't as experienced. So obviously they got better over time. Then around, let's say like three to seven months, that's when the reps were at peak performance. And then around nine months, the performance started to drop off. And what they found was the difference between the nine month reps and the three to four month reps is that the three to four month reps didn't make any assumptions when they asked questions and they basically came with a blank slate and um, just always, um, they, they did a full discovery process. Whereas, this will make more sense, the nine month reps, what happened was, is because they've had so many thousands of these conversations at this point, they know the market, they know the market's problems and they essentially assume what the uh, prospect's problems are because they've had so many conversations, they just know and they lighten up on their discovery because they've just done this so many times and they just think they know. And what they're missing is these nine month reps that the performance is falling off is it's not about, you know, 
you understanding the prospect as much as you getting the prospect to say certain things out loud so that they say it to themselves and that they feel understood. And so one of the big things, again, from that study was that um, as the as reps tend to go on, they tend to get into this going through the motions mindset and they weaken up on discovery, okay? I've had the same exact conclusions with my sales teams. As you get more experienced reps, usually what you will find when they're in ruts, okay, is number one, they lighten up on discovery. They just get lazy. They don't go as deep as they should. And that's because they've had this conversation a thousand times. It's like they talk to the prospect and it's like two minutes in, they know what the prospect needs and they're just like, okay, I know what they need. I don't need to ask them all these questions because I already get it. I read the application. I'm just going to go right onto the pitch. Obviously that doesn't work, right? You have to do this discovery. There's a lot of things to it. It builds consistency bias, right? It's not about, uh, again, what the prospect tells you. It's about what they tell themselves and then therefore have to stay consistent with throughout the call. The other thing is a lack of accountability at the close. So you'll see reps when they get into this going through the motions mindset. And again, this is like, you'll see this with your more experienced reps. They get into this going through the motions mindset. They'll either weaken up on discovery or, and or, their close sucks. And they just don't exert enough energy at the close. And I'm not saying that they need to be aggressive and like hard close people, but there needs to be more aggression in terms of like accountability or trying to find a creative way to get the deal across the line. And the fact is, our, our brains um, were, were designed to conserve energy, right? And so when we get into the motions of taking five calls a day or six calls a day, every single day, every single day, we get into this going through the motions mindset and we kind of just conserve energy. And sometimes it's just like, it's like when we have this choice of, okay, I really need to challenge this prospect, hold them accountable, tell them not what they want to hear, but what they need to hear versus I can kind of go through the motions and not have rejection and, you know, set a follow-up call and kind of take by what they're saying and hope that they show up to the follow-up and call and close, a lot of people just go the conserve the energy route, right? Because if you've ever been in sales, you'll know this, it's exhausting at times. And so you see, you see people just let off the gas and it's just really from a conserving energy standpoint and kind of a exhaustion standpoint. So again, you'll see that a lot of times with experienced reps, they start to get soft at the close again, right? Either a rejection got to them, something happened, they start to get soft or they get weak on the discovery. Almost all the times when I see good sales teams that just kind of run a rut, it's always those two things on almost everybody. Okay. So, um, last and not least, but I already mentioned this lack of conviction. Another common reason a sales rep could be in a rut. Um, you know, one message from an upset client literally can throw everything off. So this is why sharing wins at the beginning of the meeting is so important because not only does everybody have to share a win, the very uh, act of the sales rep having to scroll through all of the testimonials of this week and pull out one, read them all, pull out one, bring it to the meeting, just the very act of like scrolling through and seeing them all, it really does help, believe it or not, okay? So rounding off the corner here, we're gonna talk about high performance rituals and routines for sales, okay? It's also stuff you could do for business, but again, this routine in, in particular, um, I think a routine should be, really geared towards whatever you're optimizing around. This one was when I optimized around sales, but there's still a lot of, you know, you could still do this for business. It still would work great. So morning, we already talked about it. I wake up early, about 90 minutes minimum to three hours before calls. Okay. It's very, very key. I generally find that uh, for me, like two and a half hours uh, to three hours before calls was ideal. And a lot of the stuff you need to get done in the day, I tried to front load it because you know, look, if you wake up at 5 a.m., you're probably not going to do much sales activity at 5 a.m., you know, depending on your time zone. Um, so that's when I would get my workout in, I would read, et cetera. So what I do is I'd wake up at 5 a.m., sales meeting was at 8 a.m., so I have three hours. I'd read for 20, 30 minutes, that gets good inputs going. Then I'd work out and exercise. So during that, I would listen to a win or two wins a day. That was like my ritual every time. Now, again, I'd listen to some of my best sales calls. This reminds me, number one, that I know what I'm doing. I've done this a thousand times. I know how to close. Okay. And on top of that, listening to the wins, um, helps you kind of like set baseline and just remember of like what you at your best sounds like. And it's sort of, 
it, it takes the best you've ever done and really sets it as your floor, if that makes sense. So I do that during my workout. Then after that, I'll listen to the one win. Then I'll go into a podcast or a course or whatever. Something to develop either my sales ability, my industry acumen, personal development, whatever. Then after the workout, I'll do breath work and meditation. I always did Wim Hof breathing. This helped me tremendously again. Just really helps you focus on the words the prospect is saying. Um, then I'll double check projections, my calendar, get ready for the sales meeting. Then in the evening, so then from nine to five, by the way, from you know, 8 a.m. is a sales meeting, from nine to I leave at five, right? I want to spend, besides maybe a 30 minute lunch and uh, two 10 minute breaks or something, I want to spend every waking minute either generating calls or doing calls. Generating calls, doing calls. Generating calls, doing calls. If I'm not, hopefully the, the business owner has my calendar packed, you know, every single slot's taken. But if they don't, or I get a no-show, I need to utilize that time effectively, okay? Then at 5 p.m., what I would do is an end-of-day admin routine. So I batch all of my admin stuff, updating the CRM, notes, all this stuff, batch at all at the end. I do what's called my hot list follow-ups at the end. I'll teach you that later in the course. And um, I'd also submit my end-of-day report slash end-of-day journal that recaps my day. I rate myself on those three key areas. Um, you know, and I have some prompts and questions to make sure I'm self-aware of like where I'm at with my energy, where am I at mentally, where am I at emotionally, all those things. And then, um, I get to bed at a consistent time to where I get seven and a half hours of sleep at least, you know, sometimes eight and a half. So now if you follow into a rut, what do you do? Well, knowing what we know now, you diagnose the source of, diagnose the source of a rut. And this is the same thing you would do if you're a sales manager with your sales rep, right? So you diagnose the source of a rut. So which of the three key areas is it? Okay. Or are they just going through the motion? Or is it conviction? If they are truly in a rut, it could only be these things, right? Now, remember, if they're missing projections, is it accuracy? Is it, it's probably not, if it, but it could be accuracy. It could be insufficient volume of behavior, could be that. But if it's efficiency, right? And it's not just basic skills you need to teach them. Maybe they're ramping, it's they're in a rut, something happened, it's one of these areas, okay? So again, it's one of those things. Then once we figure out what it is, well, we fix it. I'll tell you this. Once you know, the more clear you are in the problem is, the more obvious the solution is. The issue with sales reps who are in a rut, they can't figure it out is because it's not because they know what the problem is and they don't know how to fix it. It's because they don't know they have a problem or they're trying to fix the wrong problem. Same thing with a sales manager. If your sales team as a sales manager is not performing, the only reason like if you knew why they weren't performing, you would know exactly what to do to fix it. It's usually so obvious. And all you got to do is review calls and have one-on-ones with your team and check all those three key areas, look for going through the motions, look for conviction every single time. So again, the more clear that you are on the problem, the more easier and straightforward the solution is. So resetting back to baseline, um, how do you do that? So once you identified the problem, you know the solution, we also want to reread old journals we want to look at um, the numbers and projections of when you were doing really good versus now and ask what changed, okay? So remember that projection sheet, look at the times you were doing really well versus now, what changed? Is it a numbers thing? Is it a volume thing, okay? Then also re-listen to your old wins from when you were on fire versus your calls this week when you're in a rut and figure out what's different. Like sometimes you can just tell, man, your energy sounds different, right? So again, figure out what's different, okay? Once you know, document your lessons. And remember, there's no shame of making mistakes, only shame of not learning from the mistakes. So hopefully this was helpful, guys. And uh, it's great for sales managers and sales reps alike. See you in the next training.